today I have been given a topic which is very important in our practical life, in our days in and days out of practical life whenever we are seeing patients that is chest pain beyond a mark. Whenever a person is coming to us with chest pain, definitely we are giving utmost importance whether we are dealing with MI, that is ischemic heart disease or not, acute coronary syndrome or not. But sometimes we don't think that if patient is not suffering from a MI, MI or ACS, we assure our patient party, yes, you are not having any, <coughs> any cardiovascular disease, a cardiovascular system related disease. And patient's party is very much relieved by that statement. But we sometimes forget to pick up some other causes of chest pain. Some of them could be lethal, could be life threatening. I shall try to discuss very briefly because it's already uh, 9.50. So very briefly to have your concentration so that we can pick up this thing in whenever we are seeing these patients on our bedside quickly. So that we won't be able to miss or segregate which is lethal, which one is non-lethal, like threatening or non-lethal. Thereby, we will definitely be able to save patients pocket as well as patient's pocket as well as we will give justice to the society, unnecessary burden to the patient as well as to the society. Now, I will try to cover up this topic, covering up by briefly describing how common the complaint is that is non-cardiac chest pain and what are the six in most important which we cannot miss whenever we are seeing a patient with chest pain and how do we approach to these patients whenever a patient has come with that the doctor I am having chest pain and how do you differentiate what be your approach to differentiate whether you are dealing with a life threatening causes of chest pain or not and some case challenges if time promised if time promised so so far epidemiology is concerned we have to know a little bit about it out of persons who are coming with chest pain, five percent of who are coming to emergency department, five percent of them are, five percent of them are having chest pain. And out of that, if you look at this, the last, last statement, that 60 percent of that, those who are coming to emergency department are non-organic. That means they are not having any life-threatening disorder related to cardiovascular system or gastroenterology or pulmonary system. And if you think about your own chamber, you, are, you have come wherever. If you are working in your primary health center or in your chamber, it has to shown that out of 10% of all chest pain are suffering from unstable angina. That means they are really need and only 1.5 persons has come up with MI. Now, what you have admitted that patient for chest pain and at discharge, what is the epidemiology or our statistics say? In our recent Harrison, it has said that at discharge of all chest pain which has been admitted in our tertiary care center, they have shown that out of 100 chest pain admitted patients, gastrointestinal systems related chest pain is topping the list almost 42%. Then comes down, in, here we have included the cardiac possibilities also. One third are, is dealing with ischemic heart disease and one more than one fourth that is chest wall syndrome. Others two to three or four five percent are all others like it, like pericarditis, pruritis, pulmonary embolisms, aortic aneurysm, lung cancers, and all others. So we have to concentrate whether we are dealing with all these three. They are constituting the major chunk of chest pain that is ischemic heart disease. One third, almost 50 percent, is gastrointestinal disorder and other chest wall syndrome, that is musculoskeletal diseases. Now coming to what are those I have emphasized on those six causes of chest pain which could be life threatening. We shouldn't miss, we cannot 
afford to miss these six causes of chest pain so that we can bring down mortality rate. So what is that? For easy remembrance, there is a mnemonic, what is called PAPPA. Okay? This is the first key, pericarditis. Then comes ACS, acute coronary syndrome. Then comes pneumothorax. Then pulmonary embolism and aortic aneurysm. So all five causes. What is the last? last thing is esophageal rupture. So that is the surgical stomach. So, so all these six can't miss causes. You have to. You are, you cannot miss in your bedside examinations and which could be done by just simple examinations as well as your history taking. I will come to that. So, so what is the most important part as being internist, as being inter consulted physician, what you have to consider that it has been shown that patients who come to their general practitioner's office with chest pain are much, much less likely to display life threatening causes than those who present with chest pain to the emergency room. That means a patient has come to your chamber and patient is coming to emergency department of a tertiary care center, likelihood of having life threatening disorders in emergency room is more because from their perceptions from within, patients know that I could be suffering from a very uh, life threatening disorder. That's why, that's why they don't go to the chamber. They directly come to the emergency so that they can get, if necessary, immediately be admitted. So and second, the common etiologies in the former situation, that means if they are not life threatening, it is probably related to gastric, enterological disorders, muscular skeletal, respiratory and psychosomatic. Whenever they are having they, by their uh, inner perception they come to usually they come, but we cannot be uh, by this statistic we cannot be uh, that uh, I mean we cannot be casual that that statement says that usually the cardiovascular system related adjustment would be less likely in our chamber. So what we can do in our chamber to exclude the possibilities of cardiac uh, cardiac cause of chest pain just by a very simple what is called Marburg heart score. It has been described in, nine, in 2015, just recently, how it says you have to go through only five statements and for each statement one score. I am coming to that. So what are those statements? You have to look for what is the patient's age. If patient's age above 55 male person and if patient's age about 65 if it is female. So if it is true, then one point. Second, whether patient is having known vascular disease in the form of past history of MI or CVA or peripheral arterial disease, that is PAD. So if they are having vascular heart disease, one point, that is second point. Third, patients, that pain is induced by exercise. While patient was doing some work, some heavy work, then patient had that chest pain. And that pain could not be reproduced by palpitation only. That needs some physical work. And the last one, patient himself, he is having some chest pain which could be related to heart disease. So this is the three, five important statement. Whether what is the patient's age and sex? Above 55 and male, above 65 and female. Second, whether patient is having some past history of vascular disease in the form of CVA or not. Whether patient thinks that he could be suffering from heart disease, that's why I say that from inner perception they can understand, they can realize that it could be something little, but something, uh, something like that. That's why they straight away go to not to our chamber, but to any tertiary care center. And that's why they are thinking. And two important things: whether it is exercise induced or not, and cannot be reproduced by that. So one for each. So if you think that there is only zero to one, none is positive or only one statement is positive, then the possibility of heart disease is much less, less than one percent. If score is two, it is low, it's still low, that is five percent only. If it is above three, then you have to be better to, uh, in this uh, new era of uh, picking doctors, managing doctors, better from three onwards, better to advise patients to go to the hospital. That is, if out of 5, score is 3 out of 5, there is 25% chance 
possibility of having heart disorder, heart uh, cardiovascular related disease causing that chest pain. And four to five, that means sixty percent more than two thirds are definitely suffering from some cardiovascular disease. So by just it will take only five to ten seconds if you do practice these three five uh, leading questions to the patient, and you can be soluble uh, to up to the level of sixty five percent without any investigations. Now coming to what are those life threatening disorders through which uh, on bedside? What is the question we will put to the patient? come to uh, uh, our logical uh, platform that yes, you should get admitted or you, you, can, you can ask your patient, no, you can go home without, not to worry about that thing. So not to go through this busy slide because uh, it may appear that it's very tough. I am going through another mnemonic. What is that mnemonic? And if you go by mnemonic, you will be able to uh, differentiate whether you are dealing with this five or six life threatening disorders or not. So what is that mnemonic? Legal D. So many of you may opt for liquor whiskey, liquor red wine, liquor beer, or vodka. But here I have, I have given option of liquor D. What is that? First of all, A means what is the location of the pain. Then I means what is the intensity of that pain. What is the quality of pain? Q, shock, pressure, or dull, aching, or burning, something like that. What is the upsetting that is aggravating factor? Whether exercise is getting aggravated or increased deep inspiration, that pain is getting aggravated. Then what will be the onset, whether it is sudden or it took time to develop, to come to the peak level. And relieving factors, whether if there is any or whether there is any radiation and ultimately duration, what is the duration of the chest pain. So if we are thinking, now we are coming to the previous slide, if we are thinking marker infarction, you all know, even better than me, that if a patient has come to you with a retrosternal or substernal chest pain that is getting radiated either from the jaw to the umbilical, you all know that marker ischemia related pain can extend from jaw, lower jaw, up to the umbilical, not beyond that. If patient says that I am having also pain radiated over there, it cannot be. If it is really so, it cannot be ischemia related pain. So, there, what is the radiation? And its onset really takes two minutes to hours, not all of a sudden. Associated with profuse sweating, radiation, and all this thing. So, then you will definitely go for ECGA and serial uh, markers, and the markers, all this thing. And if it is pneumothorax, patient will all the time complain of not the retro or substantial, either of the side, either this side or that side of the chest, and it's suddenly not. And whenever you are having something related to pericardial or plural, pneumothorax or plural involvement, all will give rise to pain of pluralitic pain. That means, what is that means? You all know that it is stabbing as if someone is using with their thigh and that will get in this case. So, in your pericarditis, you will get pluralitic. In your pulmonary embolism, you will get pluralitic sort of chest pain. And in your pneumothorax, you will get pluralitic pain. So the quality of the chest pain and in ischemia, you all know it's a dull, aching, burning, squeezing, that's all. It's not correct. So this way, by, by through these simple questions, you can differentiate. And another important thing, if it is outbreak disease, I don't know whether you have experience with the live case of outbreak disease or not. I have worked for two, three years in a SSTM cardiology department. I never saw any patient. I, I have been taught by my teachers for the senior form of the uh, Professor Moore, and they, whether they have seen or not, I have seen, whether any one of you have seen, but you have to know, there is the soft pain that is clearly in nature, unbearable, and that is getting ready to cross the back. And if you measure maybe, maybe they differ with two hands, and cause maybe uh, really feeble in the lower limbs compared to the upper limbs. So I am not going to it. So this way, through simple questions, you can differentiate whether you are dealing with some pulmonary or cardiovascular or something else. These are the really life threatening apart from all other things. So you have to get these patients admitted just by your simple question, any questions to the patient. Now coming to the non cardiac chest pain. So my, uh, uh, my discussion will revolve around this non cardiac. So here, non cardiac means all the time chest pain, we are putting maximum importance to that whether we are dealing. Now the non-cardiac means 
guardian uh, causes are being kept uh, aside and uh, how to define it? The chest pain that resembles heart pain in a patient who have no heart disease, who have no heart pain. So non-cardiac chest pain could be from pulmonary system, could be musculoskeletal, could be gastrointestinal. It has got different names that typical chest pain, chest pain, or heart attack, or even high heart rate. So out of that, all non-cardiac chest pain, NCC, or I'm an organ. So, so out of all these NCCP, some of them I have put it in right in because we have to put a little bit extra importance because we often come across this thing uh, in our uh, daily uh, practice. So out of chest wall syndrome, when the musculoskeletal cause for chest pain is there, most common is your osteochondritis. There are also other, you all know, you have experienced heart disease, doctors, fibrocytes, the neuropathic pain, neuropathic pain could be related to heart disease as well as diabetes, uh, mellitus, then sternoclavicular arthritis, refractor, etc. Pulmonary, I have already described, pneumonia, pruritis, never pulmonary volume, I will tell it uh, later, and there is pericarditis, I have said it, so anxiety. Another important thing, whenever you are thinking about non-cardiac, non-pulmonary causes of chest pain. If you go by textbook, Harrison, there are three divisions. Non-cardiac chest pain, non-cardiac, non-pulmonary chest pain. Whenever you have been able through your reading question, it's not related to cardiology, it's not related to pulmonology, then you are dealing with non-cardiac, non-pulmonary chest pain. Who are those? Then that means majority is formed by the gastrointestinal system, followed by musculoskeletal system, then um, your psychiatry, uh, but some psychological causes like anxiety disorder. I think you all have experienced a uh, young person is coming to you with so much anxious faces and complaining of complaining of some chest pain over there. And if you put some pressure over there, you will see that that localized part is tender. And what is that related to? That is nothing but postpondering. And you will be astonished to know out of all non-cardiac chest pain, one third of them are really suffering from osteochondritis, nothing else. So if you can diagnose osteochondritis is the cause of non-cardiac chest pain, you can jolly well assure patient with 100% surety that nothing, no harm will be, uh, will be upon you if you keep it unattended. So how do you diagnose? You all know, so I'm not getting uh, in details of it. Patient will complain of especially the pain in the osteochondral or chondrosternal junction. If you put faces over there, you will get tenderness, localized tenderness. It has got, it hasn't got any radiation usually, and there is no inflammation. Though it is itis that is inflammation, but you won't get and apart from pain and tenderness, you won't get any swelling, any redness, any temperature rate. So if you are still having some doubt, you ask the patient to lift his arm and put it, uh, put it behind, okay? Or you, you do it against resistance. What is, uh, what is that maneuver here called? That is in the last line. That is called throwing rooster maneuver. Just, uh, just against resistance, you try to uh, ask the patient to lift his hand. You try to pull it back. You are standing behind the patient. And they will come. Uh, they will complain of pain by that maneuver. So by doing booster maneuver and all other things, you can probably well diagnose with surety 100% that you are dealing with osteochondritis, which is constituting almost 30% of the non-cardiac chest pain. Now coming to that, what is the treatment options? You all know I'm not quoting, but there are sometimes very nagging sort of osteochondritis where you need to put some local anesthetic injections or some uh, or some sometimes uh, non now coming to the esophageal disorder, reflux, TER, gastroesophageal reflux, after gastrochondritis, it is uh, considering a major part of the 42% of the non-cardiac chest pain that is uh, uh, topping the list is esophageal reflux disease. So and it, th sometimes it really mimics with ischemic heart disease. If I tell you one of my own experience, one day in the dream, before going to my chamber, when I was uh, in uh, uh, peripheral um, government hospital, if 
before coming to NEA. I had just been over there. And in my early 30s, and I thought I am really happy to see So it was like that I was feeling hot, some perspiration was there, and I took immediately 300 milligram of acid. Later I later I uh, later I realized that I did just harm to my own gastrointestinal tract disorder. So this thing happens sometimes. You cannot. Uh, you are in dilemma whether you are really dealing with gastrointestinal reflux or I do five. This dilemma because it mimics anxiety and pain. Sometimes you feel more. Little bit of perspiration is there. Its location is half sternal or retro sternal. What is usually happens in anxiety. Occasional defense rate is why? Because it is also more common in obese and those who are leading sedentary life. That is also more common. In, uh, uh, ischemic heart is also more common in obese and who are having sedentary life. And preferably after heavy meals. Whenever a patient with ischemic heart disease after heavy meals, if they go for some walk or something like that, they may have precipitated. They may precipitate the chest uh, pain and duration. Both in, in both the case, minutes to hours. So how to differentiate them? Again, you have to put again you have to put some uh, training questions to the patient. What's this? What's this? I have said little bit of what's this could be there in both G E R D as well as I N D. But what's this is popular if you are if it is really related to ischemic heart disease. Second is radiation. Radiation is not there. It is localized to soft sternal or rectal sternal. But radiation typically, as I have already described, could be there in I N D. And third, very important question you. Ask the patient to stoop forward, or ask the patient whether it increases on lying down or not. If it increases on lying down and stooping forward, that means it enhances your esophageal reflux. It will increase, but that doesn't change in ISD. And another important thing is, as in ISD, we sometimes go for therapeutic testing by putting patients nitrate. It gives relief to many angina, stable angina, within a minute or two. Similarly, in GRD, you can get temporarily within a minute or two by just swallowing a gulp of water or antacid to link antacid. It will be immediate relief. So these are the things that can help you a lot to differentiate when you are in dilemma for that you are dealing with GRD or ischemic heart disease or nor cardiac or chest pain. So how to different then? Or you are still in dilemma. Sometimes we have to put patients on anti-ischemic drug as well as PPI. PPI is the, we are prescribing right and left. So still you have to go for. But you are uh, you are uh, little bit inclined for CRT. So what are the investigations you will you will order to that patient? The so investigations uh, I will uh, definitely want your uh, advice out of all those investigations which could be done to. To, uh, to confirm GRD, one is endoscopy, second is ambulatory pH monitoring, combined impedance pH testing, esophageal manometry, and acid suppression test. Which one of you? Dr. Sahab. Which one of these investigations you would like to go for? As a first test for confirmation of GRD. For past test for confirmation of here. I don't know whether you already got into my discussion or not because you have just. So, anyone or anyone? My PGT is. Acid suppression. Any other option? Yeah. So, yes, we can, any of them can. Can really can establish the diagnosis of the email. But whatever Sir or Mitro has said, or many of us thinking that that esophageal manometry is the hardest, definitely there is no doubt. But in our country, the scenario is a bit different because you have to look at the patient's pocket too. So we will go for acid suppression therapy. Okay. So acid suppression therapy, how it is being done? So why endoscopy you will not go for? As well as manometry, everyone is correct, you are correct, Dr. Mitra is correct, is correct, my PhD is correct. So why? Because in our country, it is highly specific, costly, and invasive. Because patients all the time decline. 
to go for any sort of you have experience if you have uh, ordered for it. So no sir. Apart from that, you can go for any sort of that is very good. He has not experience or she has not experience, but it appears that it would be very much helpful. So that's why they don't. So for that reason, and another important thing, if you go endoscopy, only five to ten percent of those sick can so that is, you will be able to detect. To the best, some test go if you keep aside the functional dyspepsia, where nothing could be found. Even in a manometry, will found uh, find out uh, everything is normal, including the pressure of LES. If you keep that thing aside, then the sensitivity of endoscopy will rise within 20 to 40 percent. So 60 percent of gastro gastroesophageal reflux disorder will show normal endoscopy. So in 60 percent, it won't be normal. Okay. But the most important thing is high dyspepsia. If it shows erosive gastritis, that means it is erosive gastritis related to gastritis. So you can give these doses specific nonsense. So better to go for not to convince your patient to go for that invasive testing. So what is that acid secretion test? The another name is PPI test. So you have to put patient double the dose of contest. That is two pantoprazole or avaprazole, double the dose of conventional. That is to be continued for one to eight weeks. And you all know that PPI can take two to four days for its optimal action. So that's why it is being said at this one, if it is uh, patient is better, we can take this. So it will be readily telling you that your patient is absolutely symptom free if he had a good thing. And you can probably well say that patient has been so wrong. So we can sort of not be skin and related. Now, if time is permit, I will go for two or three case studies. So there are a few cases, you will definitely enjoy it, you can interact, you can interrupt me at any point of time. So 60 year old man with chest pain, presenting complaints a 60 year old man with a history of diabetes mellitus and hypertension, presents to the emergency department with a one day history of retrosternal chest pain. The chest pain began while he had been resting and continued to worsen over the next few hours. Try to correlate with that like a D and all these things what we have already discussed. Few hours. We describe he described it is sharp pain that is moderate in intensity with radiation to his right shoulder and neck. The pain worsens when he is lying down and with any and with any deep breathing, but it is relieved by bending forward. He denies having any shortness of breath or palpitation. Now we went to the history once again. Patient has history of hypertension, I've said diabetes, hypercholesterolemia, and adenocarcinoma of the prostate. Recently diagnosed with osteochondritis before the symptoms, he had prostate for which he came to our patient. The review of his symptoms is only significant for a recent respiratory infection that had improved approximately two weeks before presentation. Smoking one pack of cigarette a day for past 20 years. Family history of coronary artery disease is there. Pulse was regular, BP 130, by 80 millimeter marker. Neck examination shows no jugular vein distension, normal heart sound, no edema, erythema in legs. Peripheral pulse is strong and symmetric. I didn't go for woman's side because it is obsolete now to be taken over a patient. So this is the history as well as clinical examination. Then some tests were done. Normal complete blood count, slightly elevated creatine kinase, initial management with aspirin, nasal nasal oxygen, sublingual nitroglycerin and morphine for pain, serial cardiac enzymes were negative. 
this was this X-ray 12 bits ECG. Then, what is the power diagnosis? Any one of them? The patient having diagnosed post-operatitis, police report, and I think she, uh, some have described any sets, and for his GRP symptom injury, and uh, there is a low radiation of the pain on the left shoulder. This, the pain is not uh, characteristic of heart disease. So the ECG is not so good. This person having AYO, right? Good guess, good guess. Because there is a possibility of the injury. Because this is not good or some, and it's very good. Um, cardiac injury also is not. Pain is relieved by tubing forward, so the possibility narrowed down to acute pain, pancreatitis and pericarditis. And after seeing the scenario, and there is a gross change in the ECG, all, all the nerves will up, upwards con, con, con So it is, it is acute pericarditis. Anyone else? Any other question? Yes, sir. Okay. So there is suggestions of gastrointestinal infection is quite logically there is suggestions by both of them pericarditis. Now you have also both of them pericarditis as well as another added TD because we can make TD definitely we have to make TD logically so that we have to reach correct diagnosis. Anyone else? So what is the probable diagnosis? Definitely acute pericarditis, acute inferior ST segment. S-segment MI, IOT dissection, pulmonary embolism, and whatever the professor has said, I absolutely uh, agree with him. Another TD should be kept, that is gastrointestinal infarction. The pop, now, the diagnosis ultimately is acute pericarditis. Both of them have said this, very good. Uh, so why this is acute pericarditis? If we get, uh, uh, if we go through this TD more clearly, it will show that that there are widespread ST elevation, ST elevation, ST elevation, ST elevation, okay, widespread, D1, D2, ST elevation, but both of them have suggested, but the concavity upwards. Everyone is, I think, concavity. Whatever we get, convexity in MR. And another important thing, if you go by the Depolarization of waves, that is TP, this part is TP, they are going down, they are going down, okay. And the here, everywhere it is raised, part the ST segment in area is different. So all these are suggested of medical, medical. So it was a diagnosis of medical. So management time. And the second case, the third case of so, 35 year old man presented complaining of pain in his left anterior chest. The pain exacerbated by trunk movement, deep inspiration, and for exercise, and lessened with decreased movement, quiet breathing, and change of position. The pain was sharp to flies. On probing, it was mentioned that the pain started gradually weeks ago and has been worsening over the past few days. He describes shortness of breath due to pain and feels other visible. He has no reported history of hypertension, coronary artery disease, prior cardiac surgery, diabetes mellitus, or hyperlipidemia. He has no family history of cardiac disease or diabetes mellitus. On examination, patient looked alert, comfortable, pulse, BBF, except the pulse where he was tachycardic, pulse was within normal limit and half a prime. Cardiac, respiratory, abdomen, all examples, uh, system examples were essentially within normal limit. On palpation, patient has sickness over the anteromedial aspect of the left ribs, who and both, as well as left side of the sternum and 
corresponding osteocortical junction joint. Investigation all are part of the normal level. So diagnosis. So that is the 30 percent of all chest pain come to our emergency room. All getting discharged, being admitted for chest pain. So not to not forget this thing. Come possible. Not in part. 35 years old lady. Teacher by profession, non smoker, on oral contraceptive field from six years. She is a known patient of type 1 diabetes mellitus on insulin. One that was worst day, not fine day, that was the worst day, she suddenly pulled us on the doorway while preparing to leave for school. On gaining consciousness, she complained of chest pain. Apart from type 1 diabetes mellitus, no history of palpitation, effort angina, syncope, P syncope, leg pain, swelling, fever, etc. What would be the probable diagnosis? Yes. Whether you are dealing with life-threatening causes or non-life-threatening causes, 
whether this patient is to be allowed to go home immediately or to be admitted. And life can be caused of chest pain must be quickly differentiated. If you go by that thing, you will definitely be able. You will need to practice it for two or three days. Stepwise differential diagnosis, so I have already discussed. So history and physical examination is definitely the most important part in differentiating one from the other, from, from uh, uh, life threatening to lock non-life threatening and diagnosis of non-cardiac chest pain risk score that is more than heart score is very very helpful and through that if it scores 4 or 5 you can be in your bedside questioning you can be 65% correct that patient is having some cardiac disorder for that chest pain and invasive invasion by that way if you be a bit clinical if you be a bit logical in putting your leading question the special invasive investigations could be reduced and the burden over the society as well as the patient could be reduced to a great extent.